he was on the short list to be nominated to the board of governors in washington to fill the seat that Lael brainerd left Lael brainerd was um member of the board of governors I believe she was vice chairman uh but she left to go to the white house but in the national economic council she by she she really is smart she's she's a big brain like she she knows what she's talking about very few of them do but she's one of them but she goes to the white house but that's an audition for secretary of the treasury because they're going to throw yellen under the bus yellen knows nothing if yellen were on this call right now she wouldn't know anything we're talking about how is that she, possible jim affirmative action she's a uh she's a uh when she was chairman of the fed i said she was incompetent and i was right and then she became secretary of the treasury she she's a she's a statistics geek from berkeley she uh she's got a big brain i'll give her credit on iq points so what that's not the same as common sense or or working knowledge or knowing how the street works she's never worked you know outside of government in her entire life i don't care what your resume is if you've never run a business met a payroll um you know negotiated a person's sale agreement um you know had kept your morale up with negative cash flow if you've never done any of those things um you don't know what it's like to be in the in the real world of the economy she doesn't but she but her specialty as an economist was was labor economics okay well there's a place for that but not not as u.s tre treasury secretary you have to know mon she didn't know monetary policy of the fed she doesn't know fiscal policy of the treasury knows no nothing about international economics and that gets us into the the role of the dollar she's just she was like a her husband won a nobel prize okay george akaloff i know a lot of her close associates um she you know if you don't want to say affirmative action you can say the peter principle uh, which, you know, this goes back to the 60s, but the Peter Principle is you, you get in a bureaucracy and you do a good job and they give you a promotion. And then you keep doing a good job and they give you another promotion. And you keep doing a good job. And eventually you get to promote it to something where you're incompetent. You're actually, you're in over your head and you fail, but then you stay there because because you're not getting another promotion um and so the result is bureaucracies are populated with incompetent people because they've all risen to their level of incompetence and have nowhere else to go i would say she got there the fed how she got another chance at treasury but that's you know that that's the answer um and uh but but leo brainerd i'll say is uh is more talented and hopefully she'll be so they'll throw you on under the bus blame her that's by the way that's the biden technique deflection and and denial and uh just blaming other people so they'll blame her for the whole thing she probably doesn't see that coming by the way maybe she should tune into london real and then uh, then they'll put little brainerd over there but mary daly was on the short list to fill brainerd's seat at the fed well you can forget that she can't get the hearing at this point but she was um running around on you know climate change uh social justice uh george floyd blm and again free country you want to express if you be my guest but not as chief regulator of silicon valley bank yeah yeah it's uh so should they have let it fail and what would have been the carnage jim if they had well again this hindsight you, you shouldn't have been allowed to get to that place anyway but there might have been more this is where there's a lack of creativity it's kind of all or nothing say like, oh if this fails we're going to have a bunch we're going to have a wave of failures of startups in silicon valley well, that's probably true probably true um but most of them fail anyway <laughs> if you know the venture capital business and i'm sure you do uh most of these things fail anyway a couple of winners here and there well if how difficult would it have been so now you're the entrepreneur you had a five you had five million dollars of working capital which you got in a, a round you know an angel round or whatever from some venture capitalists in silicon valley you got some premises you got a payroll you got some developers you got employees all that stuff and now your cash is frozen not just frozen but gone you got a look at yang money you know you got a do bill from the fdic um if those now who's to say if those companies were well run and they actually had some good technology how difficult would it have been to make a few phone calls and say you know what we're stuck in this thing um i need a i need a two-year bridge loan or i need a one-year bridge loan uh, and uh, I'll collateralize it by the proceeds of my receivership certificate. And as and when I get paid, I'll pay down the loan. We can have a simultaneous closing. All good. You you could have got money. The, those some of those friends could have got money. Some of them not. Um, maybe some layoffs. Uh, maybe they would have failed. And but most of them do anyway. I mean, that's my first point. But that was not the majority of. And you know, unemployment would have gone up. I mean, I'm not saying that there are no hardships, Brian. But but 
we gloss over the greater hardships on the economy as a whole. And that gets to the other lie, which was Janet Yellen coming out and saying, um, there's no cost to the taxpayer. Like, well, wait a second. <laughs> could, you, could you mention the bailout of the Fed taking the loans below market value and giving them, you know, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so at market value and giving them par value, which is more for one year and glossed over that whole thing. Um, but there was a separate bailout, which is the FDIC guaranteed every penny of every deposit in all those banks. Well, when you look at the numbers, you have grossly uh, depleted the insurance fund. The FDIC is an insurance company. It's, it's what the I stands for. Uh, and um, they have reserves, just like every other insurance company. They charge premiums. That's how they go. Uh, this would have basically wiped out the reserves. So how are you going to top up the reserves in the FDIC for future bank failures? Well, they said... We're going to raise premiums on the banks. Okay, they are. But uh, what do the banks do? Well, they're going to either pay you less interest or charge you fees. In other words, that, the bank isn't just going to sit there and write checks to the FDIC and, and watch their P&L evaporate. They're going to pass the cost on to the customer, which is us, which is the American people. So is, does your tax bill go up? No, but your interest rate's going down or your banking fees are going up. So the cost is shifted to everyday Americans. So don't tell me that we're not paying the bill because we are. So again, these are these are in the, the nature of government lies to kind of, you know, disguise what they're actually doing. I, uh, well, I don't have a hundred billion dollars, so maybe there, maybe there's a level where you got enough money and it's not your primary concern. Um, it, it, you know, I, I like making money, but it's not what the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning. The first thing I think about is how do you, you know, solve problems and what's going on. Um, and you know, it must seems to have some of that, maybe more than a little, uh, you know, look, if you don't have free speech and you abandon the Constitution, I mean, is this, is this like the, uh, the fall of the Roman Republic? I mean, it, there's a little bit of a, um, uncomfortable resemblance. Um, uh, again, going back to what we said earlier, you gotta, you gotta study history. It's not, it's, it's certainly not the same, but there's no better playbook for doing analysis and a really good understanding of history. It's why, um, today in America, and I would say, uh, not just communists, but neo-fascists and other forms of, dictators and we have plenty of those in washington the one of the first things they kill in the curriculum is history they stop teaching it because if you knew a lot of history you'd see you'd see these things for what they are um but um but i i had some pretty good history teachers and i've always been interested in it so uh yeah i was um i was shocked by what's revealed even though i've been around enough to maybe maybe not be shocked but but just the extent of it and and the depth of it and uh i um have a lot of sympathy for the uh, users who were suppressed and squashed and deplatformed, and even more sympathy for the victims of that kind of censorship. So we were on the front lines of that information war in 2020. And so when I see these files, I see it from a slightly different angle. I mean, April 6, 2020, we had the second largest YouTube live stream in the world that day, Jim. 65,000 wow. concurrent viewers watch me in this studio uh, have a two and a half hour conversation where things were questioned as far as efficacy of a PCR test, masks, future vaccination policies, which were really early. Even origination of the virus might have come out of Wuhan, something they'd literally almost lock you up if you had mentioned that in April right. of 2020. 30 minutes after that, Jim, for the first time in my nine year history of London Real, a video of mine on YouTube was deleted and banned. And right. I thought, what is going on here? I thought the weirdos are the people that got censored in this world. And then after that, I was subsequently banned, shadow banned from the following platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Dropbox, PayPal, right? With yep. Six figures of balances on PayPal. Dropbox, where I didn't think they were watching my videos. I mean, that's technically right. my information. And Again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I leave that to the guests on my show that come on because I think they have the right for free speech and we should all listen to what they have to say. But when I saw those Twitter files for the first time, Jim, I thought, okay, if there was a coordinated effort, it would have to come from a single source and why not come from someone who was trying to say, please, can we stop people talking about X? So I saw right. it in a slightly different side to where I was like, oh, okay, now I could see maybe how that coordination could happen. 
Um, yeah. And I like, I like the way you put it, Brian. You said with, with this guest, this particular show, you were questioning things. You weren't being categorical about this. Uh, you say, well, maybe it did come from behind. And it was, that's what you're supposed to do. Um, my, my book, the, um, the new great depression came out in January, 2021. Uh, interestingly, the publication day was supply, was delayed because of the supply chain, which was my next book. But, um, I had it pretty much done by the summer of 2020. And what strikes me was, the evidence was there then. Now, two years later, you know, you're watching, uh, whatever Tucker Carlson or, you know, Alex Berenson or others. I'm sure there are many in the UK and they're saying, well, you know, did you, do you know that the masks don't work and the lockdowns don't work? And this thing looks like it came from Wuhan. I was like, yeah, I do. And I said that in 2020, but the point is the evidence was there. It wasn't guesswork. I'll give you a real, real quick example. Um, the leading epidemiologist for virologists of the 20th century, maybe all time, is Dr. D.A. Henderson. Now, D.A. Henderson is not a household name, but if there's a single individual most responsible for eradicating smallpox on the planet Earth, it was D.A. Henderson. He won the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is our highest civilian honor, equivalent to the Congressional Medal of Honor in the military, um, dean of the uh, Bloomberg John Southkin School of Public Health. I mean, you know, you, you can't go any higher in the profession, have more respect than D.A. Henderson. He wrote a paper in 2005 that said lockdowns don't work. Um, and he had the research to back it up. This was at the time, I believe it was the swine flu was going. There was an avian flu and a swine flu during the Bush administration. Bush was actually very concerned about it. And Henderson wrote this paper, said they don't work. Uh, and I cited that in my book. But the point is, we didn't have to wait until 2021 or 2022, or in China's case, you know, today, to find out that lockdowns don't work. In 2020, we had a paper from 2005 that said the same thing. He said, if you have an island and there's no airstrip and only one way in or out, and you got a hundred people, maybe, but that's not North America, that's not Europe, that's not the world, they just don't work. Um, well, if we knew that from the leading epidemiologist, maybe of all time, uh, why didn't we follow that advice? Well, the answer was it was a hidden agenda. They they wanted to shut they wanted to shut people down. They wanted to um, uh, basically the, the the inner we empowered the inner fascists uh, in in all these government bureaucrats. Uh, I mean, it was it, it was Black Scholes, but it was Fisher Black, Myron Scholes, but there was a third contributor, and he won the Nobel Prize, which was uh, Robert C. Merton. Merton, yeah. Uh, Merton was at Harvard, and 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 Fisher and Myron had worked on this for a long time and had come close, but weren't all the way there. They went to Merton to help with the math, actually. And Merton solved the math problem for them, but to his credit, a very generous, another really, really nice guy, uh, he said, look, you guys go ahead and publish this. And then I'll, I'll tag along a few months later with my contribution. And the, the Nobel Prize is not awarded posthumously. So Fisher Black sadly died before they got the prize. So Merton and, um, and Scholes won the prize. And again, to their credit, they pulled the award divided by three and gave one third to Fisher's widow, which I thought was very, you know, appropriate and, um, uh, you know, very, uh, very uh, generous of them. But, uh, yeah, it was a math problem. You write about what they call Brownian motion, which is random. And, you know, so it was sort of, you had a, a fan, if you will, of probabilities. Um, and then, you know, different, um, different degree distributions, some more likely than others, et cetera. Having said that, um, and you know, the success of Myron used to say, you know, Jim, if, if only I had patented the idea and had like a fraction of a penny on all the notion of value, I'd be the richest man in the world, which is probably true. Yeah. Um, yeah. but they didn't, they, they put it in an academic uh, journal, but, um, uh, there are, there are assumptions in Black Shoals, which you can question. I'm not dinging the model. Science is always, Hey, let's make it better. It doesn't mean you don't use what you have. Um, but, uh, they assume a risk free rate. Well, is there really anything like, is there a risk free rate? Is the United States risk free? I, I don't think so, actually. And it's getting riskier by the day. So you can kind of question that assumption. Um, does the, the future resemble the past with some probability, some degree of distribution of probability? Not always. I mean, and maybe less frequently now than ever. And they also assume that prices move continuously. You know, prices go up and down, of course, but that you could get, 
if it were going up, you could get out of certain levels. If it were going down, you could put stop losses on your position and get out of certain levels. You could manage it. And of course, that was a big contributor to the uh, 1987, uh, October 19th, 1987 flash crash when the market fell 22 percent in one day. I mean, today we get worked up if it's down 22 percent a year, which it was last year, uh, approximately. But this is 22 percent in one day. But uh, it turns out none of that's true. Um, markets don't move continuously or if they do it's when you don't care when you do care they just gap they get gap down or they gap up you miss it you blink and it's at a completely different level it's been repriced now you can still get in and out but you've either made a lot of money or lost a lot of money you know in the blink of an eye so when you take those characteristics and this is how i started kind of you know deconstructing it if you will and said well look markets are not efficient that's nonsense they don't move continuously and slowly. They gap up and they gap down. And if you're not ready for that, you've missed the boat. Um, nothing's risk-free, so why don't we start there? When I started identifying those factors that, in my view, were incorrectly applied um, in long-term capital, but really everywhere, um, and you say, well, what, what looks like that? Well, the answer is a complex dynamic system. You know, a system that produces hurricanes and tornadoes and lightning bolts and power outages and earthquakes and tsunamis. Those are all examples of the results of complex dynamic systems. An earthquake doesn't sneak up on you. It just, you know, it just, <laughs> the ground falls out from under you instantly. Um, and that's what happens in markets. So then I said, well, maybe that's a better model. Of course, it, it, it is. So very good point, Brian. So let's go back to um, uh, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, the Latin American debt crisis, broadly defined in the early 1980s. Th that played out at the intense phase lasted about three years, you know, 82, 83, 84. It wasn't until 1990 that we got around to Brady bonds, which were the ultimate refinancing technique. But the intense period lasted about three years. Come forward to 1998, long term capital management. That it was about three months. That was uh, July, August, September, 1998. SVB was three days or less. It was like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and done. Um, and you know, I, I talked to a guy. I know we no reason to mention names, but you know, uh, um, runs runs a very one of the largest uh, endowments uh, in the world. And he said, Jim, we moved. Uh, we we were moving eight billion dollars out of Silicon Valley Bank, and we got the wire transfer request in, but. We didn't know because, you know, you get to close business Thursday. We didn't know until Sunday that the money was going to move. We got a confirmation on Monday. We didn't end up moving the money. But there was this about a 48 hour period there from Friday to Sunday when no one knew that the thing, the wires had been completed. The recipients didn't have them. It was just in limbo. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and it worked out. Um, one of the big crypto promoters, um, they, um, uh, I forget the name, well, the particular name of the bank, but they backed one of the, uh, um, one of the stable coins, actually it's USDC, yeah. uh, had three, three billion dollars in Silicon Valley Bank. And they talked about, you know, all these small entrepreneurs and startups, they got a hundred employees and five million in working capital and that money's gone and they're all going to fail. There was something to that, but, uh, the fact is you had Roku, uh, uh, Cisco, uh, eBay. I mean, there were huge companies with multi-billion dollar deposits in that bank. It wasn't all uh, all a bunch of little guys. So, um, but yeah, you can, uh, yeah, in the old days, you have to line up around the, the block and maybe it was raining, you're standing there in the rain waiting for your turn to get up to the tower. Now you can be in line at McDonald's, you know, with your cell phone and just a couple of hits, QR code, and boom, uh, you know, $10 million is, is gone. And what Peter Thiel did, uh, and it was right, I mean, I'm not criticizing him, he got his own money up, but he, he said, out like an SOS to Silicon Valley he said all of you whoever you are get your money out now uh, and a lot of, a lot of people did and that was that 40 billion dollars so so the time the time frame is becoming more more compressed because of technology you're exactly right about that which means that the response function has to be equally compressed or else you are going to have all the consequences of a you know an honest to goodness global financial crisis so and I'm not sure if everyone knows the sequence but on Friday night, March 10th, the FDIC um, took over Silicon Valley Bank and they issued a press release and they said, here's what we're doing. Um, we're taking over. Uh, we're putting it into what's called a receivership. Um, anyone with $250,000 or less, your deposits are fully insured. No, no worries. You'll have your money Monday morning and over $250,000, your deposits are gone. They didn't say frozen. They didn't say suspended. They said gone. 
and they gave you a receivership certificate, basically a, an unsecured printed up IOU from the FDIC, but not money. And it's a receivership certificate. And they said, hang on to them. Uh, in effect, um, we're going to sell assets. Uh, and as and when we realize proceeds from assets, we'll give you something. We'll give you distributions on these things. Don't know how much, don't know when. We'll do the best we can. Remember in the RTC days in the early 90s, uh, they, it took them two years and they were, they were very efficient. I worked with them at the time They we were in their offices when we were sitting on boxes because they didn't even have furniture, but they were doing deals. So they had the right, the right attitude, but that took two years. So, um, uh, and that was it. Well, that's when, the, that's when I call the, uh, the billionaire crybabies came out in force. Uh, you know, Bill Ackman, all these guys, oh, you got to save us. You know, I was like, well, you got to trade on Bill. <laughs> Five billion is not enough. But anyway, they pounded on the White House all weekend. Now here, here's something that very few people, I say almost nobody knew at the time except the management, although they seem to be asleep at the switch. Everyone's like, yes, yeah, startups, venture capital. And then there's a lot of truth to that. 97% of the deposits of Silicon Valley Bank were uninsured. And by the way, that's my new metric for assessing banks. You used to look at, you know, working capital and debt equity ratios and, you know, bad, bad assets, governments. There are lots of ways to measure the health of a bank. But the most relevant way right now is, and this is publicly available, take the ratio of uninsured deposits to total deposits. 30% is comfortable. If you're like, I guess, you know, 70% of my deposits are insured, which means they're not panicky. They're not necessarily going to run for the hills. 30%, okay, uninsured, but I have assets. I have, I have that much cash or more. That's a comfortable ratio. When you get over 50, you're in the danger zone. Well, Silicon Valley Bank was 97% uninsured which meant all the money was going to run and it did so that's the way if you're looking at these big banks or uh um, you know any any institution or your own savings institution to to look at it but um but silicon valley bank was a climate bank were they investing in startups yes were they investing in technology yes but these were climate these were green new scam uh uh startups looking at you know battery technology uh you know the chemi- chemistry physics you know to try to make a better battery but the, not much improvement in the battery in in 200 years but um uh, they're they're working on it um you know wind turbines uh you know other sustainable fuel alternatives etc again i'm not do that if you like if that's your field of research but so much this is subsidized by the government and then further subsidized by Silicon Valley Bank. And that's where the, that's where the assets were. That's where the loans were by and large. And so the White House is getting hammered, not only because of entrepreneurs, job losses. And by the way, we are in an election cycle here in the United States, yeah. but from the greenies who are extremely powerful. So within, so that was Friday night. So Saturday, everyone's crying to the White House. Sunday night at six o'clock. By the way, mark that on your calendar. Sunday, 6 p.m. is when they tell you what they're going to do. You know, they, you know, uh, 6 p.m. Sunday, November 12th, they came out on, uh, sorry, March 12th, they came out on uh, Silicon Valley Bank. The following week, 19th, that was Credit Suisse. Brian, so let's go back to um, uh, either Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, the Latin American debt crisis broadly defined in the early 1980s. That, that played out at the intense phase lasted about three years, you know, 82, 83, 84. It wasn't until 1990 that we got around to Brady bonds, which were the ultimate refancy, refinancing technique. But the intense period lasted about three years. Come forward to 1998, long term capital management. That uh, was about three months. That was uh, July, August, September 1998. SBB was three days. Or less. It was like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and done. Um, and you know, I, I talked to a guy. I know we no reason to mention names, but you know, uh, um, runs runs a very one of the largest uh, endowments uh, in the world. And he said, Jim, we moved. Uh, we we were moving eight billion dollars out of Silicon Valley Bank, and we got the wire transfer request in, but we didn't know because you know you get to close business thursday we didn't know until sunday that the money was going to move we got a confirmation on monday we didn't end up moving the money but there was this about a 48 hour period there from friday to sunday when no one knew that the thing the wires had been completed the recipients didn't have them it was just in limbo um and uh uh you know and it worked out um one of the big crypto promoters um they um uh, forget the name well the particular name of the bank but they back one of the uh um one of the stable coins actually it's usdc yeah. uh had three three billion dollars in silicon valley bank and they talked about you know all these small entrepreneurs and startups they got 100 employees and five million in working capital and that money's gone and they're all going to fail 
there was something to that but uh the fact is you had roku uh uh cisco uh ebay i mean there were huge companies with multi-billion dollar deposits in that bank it wasn't all uh, all a bunch of little guys so um but yeah you can uh yeah, in the old days you have the lineup around the the block and maybe it was raining you're standing there in the rain waiting for your turn to get up to the tower now you can be in line at mcdonald's you know with your cell phone and just a couple of hits qr code and boom uh you know 10 million dollars is gone and what peter thiel did uh and he was right i mean i'm not criticizing him he got his own money up but he he said out like an SOS to Silicon Valley he said all of you whoever you are get your money out now uh and a lot of, a lot of people did and that was that 40 billion dollars so so the time the time frame is becoming more more compressed because of technology you're exactly right about that which means that the response function has to be equally compressed or else you are going to have all the consequences of a you know an honest to goodness global financial crisis so and I'm not sure if everyone knows the sequence but on Friday night March 10th, the FDIC um, took over Silicon Valley Bank and they issued a press release and they said, here's what we're doing. Um, we're taking over. Uh, we're putting it into what's called a receivership. Um, anyone with $250,000 or less, your deposits are fully insured. No, no worries. You'll have your money Monday morning and over $250,000, your deposits are gone. They didn't say frozen. They didn't say suspended. They said gone. And they gave you a receivership certificate, basically a, an unsecured printed up IOU from the FDIC, but not money. And it's a receivership certificate. And they said, hang on to them. Uh, in effect, um, we're going to sell assets. Uh, and as and when we realize proceeds from assets, we'll give you something. We'll give you distributions on these things. Don't know how much, don't know when. We'll do the best we can. Remember in the RTC days in the early 90s, uh they it took them two years and they were they were very efficient i worked with them at the time they we were in their offices when we were sitting on boxes because they didn't even have furniture but they were doing deals so they had the right the right attitude but that took two years so um uh and that was it well that's when the, that's when i call the uh the billionaire crybabies came out in force uh you know bill ackman all these guys oh you gotta save us you know and i was like well you got to trade on bill <laughs> five billion is not enough but anyway they pounded on the white house all weekend now here here's something that very few people I say almost nobody knew at the time except the management although they seem to be asleep at the switch everyone's like yes yeah, startups venture capital and then there's a lot of truth to that 97 percent of the deposits of silicon valley bank were uninsured and by the way that's my new metric for assessing banks you used to look at you know working capital and debt equity ratios and you know bad bad assets governments there are lots of ways to measure the health of a bank but the most relevant way right now is, and this is publicly available, take the ratio of uninsured deposits to total deposits. 30% is comfortable. If you're like, I guess, you know, 70% of my deposits are insured, which means they're not panicky. They're not necessarily going to run for the hills. 30%, okay, uninsured, but I have assets. I have, I have that much cash or more. That's a comfortable ratio. When you get over 50, you're in the danger zone. Well, Silicon Valley Bank was 97% uninsured which meant all the money was going to run and it did so that's the way if you're looking at these big banks or uh um you know any any institution or your own savings institution to to look at it but um but silicon valley bank was a climate bank were they investing in startups yes were they investing in technology yes but these were climate these were green new scam uh uh startups looking at you know battery technology uh you know the chemi chemistry physics you know to try to make a better battery but not much improvement in the battery in in 200 years but uh there's they're working on it um you know wind turbines uh you know other sustainable fuel alternatives etc again i'm not do that if you like if that's your field of research but so much as is subsidized by the government and then further subsidized by silicon valley bank and that's where the that's where the assets were that's where the loans were by and large and so the white house is getting hammered not only because of entrepreneurs job losses and by the way we are in an election cycle here in the united states yeah but from the greenies who are extremely powerful so within so that was friday night so saturday everyone's crying to the white house sunday night at six o'clock by the mark that on your calendar sunday 6 p.m is when they tell you what they're going to do you know they you know uh, 6 p.m sunday november 12th they came out on uh sorry march 12th they came out on uh silicon valley bank the following week 19th that was credit swiss the math and the science behind 
diversification and why it's a good strategy is very clear. That's not much debate about that. The problem is people don't understand what diversification means. They think if they have 50 stocks in 10 sectors, semiconductors, consumer non durables or whatever, they're diversified. And what I say to them is you may have 50 stocks, but that's one asset class. You're in stocks. And in stressful situations, they become highly correlated. So you're not getting the benefit of diversification. You think you are, but you're not. So what does a diversified portfolio look like? Well, I have a slice of stocks. I'm not anti-stock market, but you got to pick the sectors and the stocks that will perform well, even in the kind of conditions we're talking about. And I would go back to energy, natural resources, agriculture. So, you know, uh, a marathon, ExxonMobil, Chevron, ADM, uh, Cargill, um, uh, you know, uh, mining companies uh, and not just gold gold yeah but um, i recently invested in a lithium mine uh I, I the green new deal i call it the green new scam uh, and it's a scam but it doesn't mean it doesn't have legs whether it's whether you like it or not the fact is uh it's going to go on so the lithium's in short supply uh graphite you know etc so there is a portfolio you can have which is natural resource oriented that will do well even in the kind of tough environment we're talking about slug of cash absolutely maybe as much as 30 percent I like treasury notes, 10 year treasury notes, but you know, season to taste. If it's, if they're a little too volatile, look at five year notes, two year notes. They're going to come down a lot, not right away, not tomorrow morning, but um, sooner than later because of everything we discussed, which is, uh, you know, recession and interest rates will follow or lagging indicator, but that'll happen. Bonds, particularly the, the sovereign bonds, especially the US treasuries, they're looking the best they've seen in, in a long while. and and. You know, relatively recently, some have said it's like the best I've seen in my career. So I'm just curious: does do you find that compelling for the moment in time we're in here? Absolutely. There's a I hate to get too deep in the weeds in terms of bond math, but there's something called a DBO one. DBO one is the dollar value of one basis point. What that means is, you know, obviously basic bond math: interest rates come down, the value, the, the price of the bond goes up. They're just invert. It's a little counterintuitive, but the question is how much. And the lower the interest rate the more the price of the bond goes up for every basis point drop in rates. Mm. So in other words, if you go from 9% to 8%, you'll have a nice capital gain on your bond. But if you go from 3% to 2%, it's still a 1% drop, but you're gonna have a much bigger capital gain. You know, in, in each instance, it's a 1% drop in rates, but the amount of capital gain on the bond is much higher in other words, the DBO one is higher when the rates are lower. Again, it's all counterintuitive. The lower the rate, the greater the capital gain on each basis point drop in yields. Yep. That's the basically. So yeah, when you're you, you go from three percent to two percent, that's a home run in terms of capital gains. So you get the yield, you get the safety, you get the liquidity, and if you feel like selling it, you got a nice fat capital gain. Gold, I always recommend a ten percent slice. But based on what we were talking about, I would get silver dollars, American silver eagles. Yeah, the monster box. That's uh, you know bit of jargon. Monster box comes from the U.S. Mint, Treasury green, nice shade of green. It comes with a compression strap. I recommend don't open it, you know, unless you know, do, do not break except in case of fire. But inside are 500 one ounce American silver eagles. That's a lot. They'll feed your family for probably a year. Yeah, you know, it's a market price, It'll be around ten, twelve thousand uh, $12,000 for a monster box. But to me, it's like battery and flashlight. I like them both. And, you know, I talk about gold a lot because it's a, a form of money and um, I do the monetary analysis. Uh, I mean, I do invest in gold mines, but I don't hold myself out as a geologist, but I do think about it from a monetary perspective. And then people always say, Jim, what about silver? What about silver? I'm like, look, if, if gold soars the way I expect, silver's along for the ride. There's, there's no, there's not going to be a world of $3,000 gold and $20 silver. That world doesn't exist. If gold's at 3000 silver's going to be pushing 100. So without giving an exact forecast, uh, silver will be along for the ride. Silver is a little more difficult to analyze because it has industrial applications. Gold really doesn't. Gold's not good for anything except money, but it's the best form of money. Silver can be, is used in a lot of applications. So if you have a recession, it's perhaps the case that the monetary value is going up, but the industrial input value is going down. So it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, but silver is going to do fine. And I do think it's extremely practical because in a world of CBDCs, silver will be a form of spending money. Gold, even the eight gram coin, I mentioned the quarter ounce American Gold Eagle, still 500 bucks. It's like pulling a $500 bill out of your wallet. You know, it's, it's a lot for groceries. Home prices are coming down a little more in some markets than others, but uh, if it's income producing and it's solid and it's a place like, you know, uh, some place people want to be like Austin or Phoenix or whatever. I mean, I know there 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 there's markets down a little bit right now, but you know it's like buying a, a ten year bond. You know, it's got steady monthly income and uh, or certainly farmland. 
uh, but in income producing real estate, not commercial office buildings should be a part of a diversified portfolio. Yes. I, I like private equity and it's, you know, you got to credit investor issues and uh, finding good deals and good promoters and good management, but you know, some good deals in the mining sector. Um, I like uh, well, that, 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 that would be one. I, mean, I want to talk to you real quickly about the current state of media. I, I just love to hear your thoughts on this because I, I, I know this is something that you care about, that you've written about a bit. Um, and, uh, and you're playing a role in trying to give people, you know, more accurate, more nutritious, more actionable information than, than what they're able to get from the new sources that they're just directed to by society. Um, if you talk about what they call legacy media, mainstream media, so Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, NBC, ABC, CBS, MSNBC, right. CNN, that run of characters. The first thing you discover is, I know a lot of these people, I've been on all these programs, I know this for a long time. I spent a lot of time in Washington, I had dinner with most of the, or lunch or whatever, dinner actually more often with most of the names you've heard about. Um, some of them are fine, some of them are nice. A lot of them are either not that bright, or, I mean, they're good on camera they need, uh, or whatever. They got a desk at the Washington Post. They're not that bright. Or if they've got some degrees, they've been kind of indoctrinated. We're at the point now, uh, I mean, a lot of these people are 28, 33, 34 years old. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, you know, good. You're, you're in the heart of your career. But that means they graduated from school in, uh, you know, 2016, 2017 or whatever. Um, and they're thoroughly indoctrinated. Uh, I'm, I, I, um, I mean, I went to school when uh, uh, we, learned, we learned, it was pretty rigorous. I mean, I, I had one program where the, they graded, you needed a C plus average to graduate, but they graded on a C minus curve. So you're like, well, how do you get it? How do you, how do you even get a C plus if they're grading on a C minus curve? And the answer is people quit. And in, in other words, you were, you were trying to struggle to be, I did get an A in partnership taxation. And I'm proud of that. But my, the standards are down. The mission standards are down. Affirmative action takes over. When you get into the classroom, I don't care where you're at, you know, Ivy League, whatever, it's just indoctrination. The market has a way of sorting it out. I mean, the revenues are down, advertising's down, the viewers are down, subscriptions are down. Eventually, they will go out of business, not overnight. And then new media channels will arise. And, you know, there's a lot of garbage on the internet, but there's a lot of good stuff. And, um, you know, if you want to keep tabs on the war in Ukraine, you have to know where to look. It's not easy, but there are a number of channels with and i'm talking about you know military officers you know colonels you know brigadier generals um people on the ground in ukraine not you know some studio in new york you can find out what's going on but i think my intelligence training is helpful because you have to be very persistent and know how to dig 67 cents an ounce we've gone back to the 1920s earlier through most of the 19th century but the United States and sterling, I think it was 475. It could be off a little bit on that, but you know, it was four, four pounds and, and change. And as late as World War I, say 1913, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to, you know, at the time Bombay, today Mumbai, you took a purse of uh, British sovereigns. British sovereign is, is about, uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce, it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even, even today, what are you going to do with a one ounce coin? It's worth, you know, almost $2,000. Uh, you know, you're not going to use that for, to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time. And it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was the gold was the money. And people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign, that's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971, when we decouple completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3,000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War I. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war, whether it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war 
until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic, it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're going to, if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? They melted it down and made 400 ounce bars. And they said, don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're they're heavy, they weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks and the Federal Reserve System sold all the banks. Hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold, but people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three, uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and, you know, hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. And it's there. And look on the, look in the assets. And the first line item is gold certificate. And it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that that 11 billion is actually worth 470 billion. So the Fed has a hidden asset of 450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet represented by a gold certificate. But it's not the gold, the treasury has the gold. And by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, you know, just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hit it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it, and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously in the U.S. We still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half. No, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold 1,000 tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. Uh, if I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it now since 1980. And inflation is coming down, by the way. And uh, having said that, the target is 2%. So he's, he's not there, but he's making progress. Now, Wall Street's saying, you're done. You, you, you did it. Mission accomplished. Inflation is coming down. You got what you wanted. Give it time. Stop raising rates. You're going to kill the economy. But the Fed is saying, well, we actually don't know. We can't untangle it. Yes, inflation is coming down. That's objective. But is it coming down because we're still raising rates? Or is it coming down because we're at the terminal rate? Those are two different things. 
And right now, and this is what Powell's been saying, the Fed leans to the view that they're not at the terminal rate, that inflation is coming down because they're raising rates. They have not achieved the terminal rate. So Powell and the Fed have said, yeah, inflation is coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate and then we'll pause. And then if we're right, we'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all this stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff. I mean, the Fed's thinking mid 2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street and I'll say markets, not just Wall Street, but the big money in places like uh, the euro dollar futures curve and, and the U.S. Treasury curve, which are highly inverted, are saying, no, you're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause a going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think. Uh, and rates are going to have to come down uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it. And you'll probably be the last to know. So with Wall Street, with the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message. Why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. And everyone knows, you know, Volcker became Fed chairman in 1979. He, he stayed on until the um, early to mid 80s. Uh, and he did raise interest rates to 20% or very close to it to kill inflation, which went up to 15% uh, at the time. But people forget that there was a recession in 1980. It was sharp, but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates. And the industry said, fine, we're just not gonna lend anybody any money. The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the, with the uh, pandemic panic. Uh, and then they said, oh, sorry, just kidding. And then, and then uh, they took the ceiling off and then things got back to normal. Now, this was a time when farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington and they were circling the Fed building. And one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That I mean, that all happened. So uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker, uh, not quite panicked, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not 0.7, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which number one was unnecessary because the recession was caused by a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected. And number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse. And that's when Volcker had to raise rates to 20%. And Volcker, in hindsight, he said, we, we shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission. So now Powell, remember Powell's not an economist, he's a lawyer. So he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that, you know, looking at both sides. Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, before the battle against inflation is won, because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger, and then you do have to destroy the economy, as we did in 1981-82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then, but at the time that was horrific. But Volcker and others have said that was a blunder he never should have done. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy. And that's what's driving him, even as Wall Street screams, you're already there. So so the question is, how does this play out? In my view, how probably is there? He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat, at least where I went to school, curve was curved. This, this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't, but the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, if you want to forecast has Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed because you have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest, the unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. You know, as I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. They think they have to keep fighting this fight, but here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. 
Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year, there, there are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it, is, it is coming down, but there are two sources of inflation. And it's going to sound obvious, but you got to separate them, the supply side and the demand side. Both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And, you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Now, and again, this is what my book Sold Out is about, the breakdown of the supply chain, partly related to energy, partly related to the war in Ukraine, partly related to the pandemic panic. Uh, as I explained, in the book, it actually predates that. The breakdown started in 2018 with Trump's trade war. And then COVID made it worse, yes. Ukrainian war made it worse, yes. But it, it really started before that. So of course, prices went up and people were trying to pay whatever they had to, to get what they needed. And energy prices were a big driver of that. So that feeds through as a form of inflation. The other kind of inflation is from the demand side. So the supply side is called cost push. Costs go up and they push it onto the consumers. The other kind is from the demand side. It's called demand pull. And basically consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. And so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side, but by the late 70s, 80s, and Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could but it hasn't happened yet. Here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. So it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if I'm right, I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. So it, it does tend to depress um, demand, destroy demand and hurt the economy. And then it slows down and then the inflation comes down on its own. That appears to be happening. But Powell hasn't really made the distinction. He's still, he's fighting the last war, I had to use a cliche, but he's fighting the Volcker war. Powell doesn't want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He thinks the battle's not won. He has to get to the terminal rate. In reality, he's probably already there. The future is very positive for gold. Uh, you have the normal vectors. You know, uh, supply is flat, but has been for six years. Demand is going up. Central banks have flipped from net sellers to net buyers. That's a big deal. Um, and the retail institutional interest is higher. So that's good. Geopolitical threats don't need to say a lot. You know, from the U.S. perspective, Iran, China, North Korea, Venezuela, Russia, you name it. So that's the vector. But the biggest driver right now is what I referred to a few minutes ago, negative real rates. Because gold as a form of money, which is how I view it, competes with other interest rate, competes with other instruments, treasury bills, et cetera. Well, if they have high yields and gold has no yield, you want the treasury bills. But if, uh, if interest rates have negative yields and gold's just flat, gold looks more attractive. So that's the main driver and that's going to continue. Everyone's like, well, you know, the gold is up, gold is down. Uh, but when, the, so what do you mean when you say that? And they're talking about the dollar price of gold. And it's like, okay, so the dollar price of gold is up or down. That's really a cross rate. That's so different than talking about the Euro US dollar exchange rate or, or Australian dollar US dollar exchange rate. If you think of gold as money, and I do, then the dollar price of gold with gold measured by weight, not as another currency, uh, it is another form of money, but with gold measured by weight, it's a cross exchange rate. When the price goes up, I would say that what's really happening is the dollar is going down. In other words, I think of gold by weight. I, I'm interested, you know, do you have a, uh, do you have a ton? Do you have uh, 50 kilos? Do you have five ounces? Whatever you have as an individual investor or as a bank, I think of it by weight because when someone says gold's really going up. I said, well, no, the dollar's going down. You need more dollars to purchase 
a fixed quantity of gold, which means the dollar is worth less. And when people say, the gold's really going down, I say, no, the dollar's worth more and you need fewer dollars to purchase a quantity of gold. You know, when, when people talk about price, the first thing they do is they're really talking about dollars. You know, I mean, this is a euro price for gold, but it, the world market is based on dollars. You're privileging the dollar as the numeraire. The numeraire is your counting system. You know, is it yards, inches, feet, whatever. And if you put the dollar first and say gold is in dollars and it's going up or down, I think you have it backwards. I think you need to put gold first by weight. And then if it's worth more, the dollar's going down. If it's worth less, the dollar's going up. And so when you say gold is going up, let's say it went to $2,000 an ounce. It was, oh, the price of gold went up. You know, it just went up uh, 10%. Um, well, did it or did the dollar go down? Uh, the way I would phrase it is, you know, it used to be $1,800 to get an ounce of gold. Now it's $2,000 to get an ounce of gold or, you know, your dollar got you one eighteen hundredth of an ounce. Today, it only gets you one two thousandth of an ounce. Uh, in other words, gold didn't do anything. It's a metal. It's an element, atomic number 79. What happened was the, the dollar got stronger. So a stronger dollar is a lower dollar price for gold and a weaker dollar is a higher dollar price for gold. So when people talk about gold going up, what they're really talking about is the dollar going down. We have new numbers regarding how much gold central banks are buying, 400 tons in Q3 this year, records and numbers we haven't seen since the 80s. Uh, yet we don't know some of those mystery buyers. Obviously, the theories are that are, that are that they are Russia and China. Now, China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything, but Switzerland's down a thousand tons. The U.S. was down a thousand tons after losing, uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now, it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a, as a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one, literally one month, their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons. Well, you know the market. You, you can't buy 300 tons in, in a month, not, not one country in one order. But they had it all along, but they decided to reveal it, put it on their balance sheet. So uh, Americans don't seem to like gold. I'm not sure Canadians feel much differently or others around the world, uh, but central banks sure do. And I think that tells you something. There's huge demand for dollars all over the world, not because of the currency, but because of collateral, because of treasury bills. Banks need treasury bills to pledge as collateral for derivatives. It's the best collateral in the world. Um, and if you don't have it, you're not going to be able to leverage your balance sheet as much as you would like. You're not going to be as profitable. You're not going to be able to support lending and investing, which is what banks in theory are supposed to do. To, to support the bloated balance sheets and to support the derivatives, you need collateral. And the better the collateral, the more leverage you can have. The best collateral in the world is a treasury bill. And so there's a mad scramble for treasury bills, which means there's a mad scramble for dollars to buy treasury bills. And that is coming from European banks, it's coming from Chinese banks um, and banks around the world, but primarily European and Chinese. And that's not going away. So it's, it's, it's funny to hear people, or people think it's funny to hear anyone talk about a dollar collateral shortage, like, hey, haven't you flooded the world with dollars? Hasn't the Fed printed $9 trillion? And the answer is they have, but that's not the measure. It's, it's, a, it's a high multiple of that. It's the dollar value of all the collateral because in the repo markets, you know, I pledge the collateral to you and then you pledge it to somebody else, one of our colleagues, and then she pledges it to somebody else, et cetera. That collateral gets pledged 50 times and supports not one dollar a balance sheet but fifty dollars a balance sheet for a dollar of collateral so you restrict the collateral you're restricting the balance sheet the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight but as a payment currency there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency anything can be a payment currency if i want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that then it's a it's a currency 
So all of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a radical change in how we pay for things. I can give you 20 reasons why the dollar should go down, but I'll give you one big reason why it won't, which is the demand for collateral. And so that's keeping the dollar constant, which is keeping the dollar price of gold constant because gold doesn't change and the dollar's not changing. Now that'll break um, and that'll break in favor of gold, meaning the dollar will get a lot weaker. It'll have to, but it's going to take a few months at least because the U.S. economy has to get weaker, which it is. The Fed will figure this out maybe by September, like next September. Um, and uh, then they'll ease a little bit and they'll try to weaken the dollar to try to give the U.S. economy a boost. But we're not there yet. So it's going to be now that doesn't mean the price of gold is going down a lot. I'm just saying it's not going to go up a lot. It's going to chug along kind of sideways. But when it breaks, it's going to break big to the upside because the dollar is going to go to the downside. But that's probably at least um, still a few months away, maybe longer. I mean, that's um, about a 14% decline. Um, look, you know, GDP, the standard definition is, uh, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus, you know, government expenditure, like a four-part thing. Yeah, but there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working, how productive are they? Just who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit. You know, it's a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working... Or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home. Um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out, uh, I think, a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robinhood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well. But, um, but a lot of people saved the money. But, but there was a very, there were de very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money, they'll go buy stuff. And that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it, yeah, it, 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 um, it looked good, but we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks. Uh, and so you had a lot of people lost the habit, a lot of people staying home, watching, you know, maybe, uh, the World Series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody, but, but some. And, um, the other problem is, uh, you know, because people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, there help on the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying a $35,000 for an entry level like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker uh, with benefits, training and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for, you know, a entry level hamburger person. Um so there are late that and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million, you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers, not, willing workers, yeah, not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. You know, as employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins, you know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of 
uh, how stressed businesses and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs and big, layoffs, big, yeah. big layoff announcements coming every day. So, um, not, but none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy. But, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I always say, if you if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are, as an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First, that's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw a Phillips curve was flat. Oh, or I went to school, curves weren't flat. But that's uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators. You, you brought up um, chapters one and two from, from currency wars where you, you basically highlight uh, this scenario. Um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that Russia and China would accumulate large gold reserves, pool their gold, and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the U.S. dollar. Is that the form it would take for you, something backed by gold? Probably, and here's why. Um, and, and by the way, when I, when I wrote that, when we did the war game, and when I wrote that, Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less, that we know of. And they may have several thousand tons off the books in the State Administration of Foreign Exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. Um, so... But uh, everyone's like, well, the Chinese yuan is going to be the global reserve currency. No, and it's not going to be the group. Of, but, but, but here's why. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons. But the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like dollars per se. So if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist. Uh, very small scale, very liquid, no primary dealers, no win issue trading, no auctions, um, no repo, none of the sell- no settlement clearance, none of the uh, the plumbing and the mechanics of um, of a mature bond market such as the uh, the United States, uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you you know somebody reneges on treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for want of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and and certainly the ruble will not replace the dollar as a reserve currency. However. What I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets, so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the ruble aren't going to replace anything. In the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim, um, how, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well, uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they? Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver. You know, fine art. Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone. They estimate two hundred million dollars. You could have bought that for fifty thousand in the in the nineteen seventies. Uh, that's that's a little more specialized. But there are you know natural resources, uh, water, you know, et cetera, uh, energy, oil. Uh, if you want to be in stocks, okay, get stocks of companies that are based on natural resources, um, you know, such as you know, Exxon Mobil, Chevron. I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm just giving these as an example, but um, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself. But uh, um, 
you know, a regular stock portfolio um, is not a good one. And, you know, banks are going to be in, in distress. Money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what the liquidity crisis is. We, we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like, what's what's truly going on there? Um, do we have a, uh, is, is it just an aging population that truly can't work? Um, I know that disability has been a, it's seen massive growth over the past like 15 years. Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever, but what's responsible for us only having 62% of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well, there are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. You know, you, you, you listen to a number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it low is low. In other words, the, the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say how many people are working. That's the, the, the numerator. And how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now, it's never 100%, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others that are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or, uh, you know, performing other roles enter the workforce. And then that number went up. So it, like I said, it's never a hundred, but 70 was very strong. 62 is, is down a lot. I mean, that's, um, about a 14% decline. Um, look, you know, GDP, the standard definition is, um, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus, you know, government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah. But there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working? How productive are they? Just who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink and less productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit, you know, it's a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working, or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home. Um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out, uh, I think, a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robinhood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well. But um, but a lot of people saved the money. But but there was a very there were de very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money, they'll go buy stuff. And that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it, yeah, it, 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 um, it looked good, but we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks. Uh, and so you had a lot of people lost the habit, a lot of people staying home, watching, you know, maybe, uh, the World Series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody, but, but some. And, um, the other problem is, uh, you know, because people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, there are help on the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying a $35,000 for an entry level like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker, uh, with benefits, training and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for, you know, a uh, entry level hamburger person. Um, so there are late and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million, you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers, not, willing workers, yeah, not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. You know, as employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins. 
you know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers, but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of, uh, how stressed businesses and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs and they're, big, layoffs, they're big, yeah. big layoff announcements coming every day. So, um, not, but none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy. But, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I would say, if you're, if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like, even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are, as an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's, that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First, that's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw Phillips curve was flat. Well, where I went to school, curves weren't flat, but that's, uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators.